Welcome to Brown Bag History. Uh, today we're talking about a film that was uh, filmed in Revelstoke in 1936 called Silent Barriers. As we start, we acknowledge the land, traditions, and culture of four nations. The Snipe, the Sequetmec, the Tanaha, and the Okanagan Nation Alliance. We acknowledge our use and inhabitation of this land sacred to these four nations. We respectfully honor their traditions and culture. So the Silent Barrier, originally known as the Great Barrier, was a film that was produced by Gaumont British Picture Corporation, which was a large British uh, film company. Uh, they owned uh, several large cinemas in the UK, as well as um, a couple of, um, of studios, including Lime Grove Studios and Islington Studios. Uh, some of Alfred Hitchcock's uh, early movies were filmed there. Um, Silent Barriers was originally called uh, the, the Great Barrier, and it was based on a book called uh, Track of Destiny or The Great Divide by Alan Sullivan. It was pub published in 1935. Alan Sullivan was a Canadian writer, uh, 1868 to 1947. He was born in Montreal, Quebec. He wrote more than 40 novels and many short stories. Uh, the book is actually available online. Uh, I was able to find it quite easily with a Google search as an e-reader download or a PDF file. Um, I'm going to read you the first paragraph. It'll give you the, an idea of the, the style. Shaped like a gigantic S with shallow curves, the pass lay between a tangle of mountains on whose precipitous flanks wild goats sprang from ledge to ledge. Above it towered scarred peaks, first to blush under the rising sun, last to retain the dying glory. Eastward, westward, the land fell away to ravines and hanging valleys and glacier-fed lakes in whose shining surface shimmered the reflection of gaunt, inaccessible summits. That was not just the first paragraph, that was the first sentence. <laughs> there were a few semicolons and dashes in there though. Um, so it was basically a uh, fictional account of the discovery of Rogers Pass and the construction of CPR. The movie itself was very fictionalized, probably even more so than the uh, than the uh, than the book. Um, it was complete with forest fires, riots, fights, horse chases, train wrecks, drowning in river rapids, gamblers, a prostitute with a heart of gold, and of course a love story. Um, in uh, January of uh, 1936, uh, producers of the Gaumont British Company, George Busby and Jeffrey Barkas, uh, accompanied by the uh, author, uh, Alan Sullivan, traveled along the CPR en route to Vancouver, making preliminary arrangements for filming. Uh, they decided that Revelstoke would be the headquarters for the film. Uh, the Board of Trade President, uh, Frank Al Alwood, stated that uh, the securing of this major enterprise for Revelstoke was largely the result of the Board of Trade entertaining Mr. Sullivan, the author, last fall. So they really felt that they'd made a good case for uh, the movie to be, to be filmed here. Uh, Frank Allwood and his family were quite in, actually quite involved in the sort of cultural and theatrical scene in Revelstoke. Mrs. Allwood was quite involved in uh, Dramat, local dramatics and uh, teaching, acting and singing uh, to, to children. So they became quite involved in the, in the film and became quite close friends with a lot of the, the cast and crew members. And uh, we actually have a scrapbook uh, that was collected by the Allwood family. That's where quite a few of the photographs came from. Um, the director was Milton Rosmer, who was a British uh, film actor and director. The technical crew arrived in Revelstoke at the end of March in 1936 to begin the preparation and initial filming of the winter scenes. Uh, there were several tons of cameras, films, and equipment arriving uh, during that week. They also uh, looked, uh, hired a number of uh, local men uh, to assist in the hauling of equipment. Uh, over the course of the film, they were expecting to be hiring um, hiring up to 500 local people as extras. This was good employment during the Great Depression. You know, Revelstoke was, it was just kind of 
um, so after several years in the depression, there weren't a lot of really good paying jobs available. A lot of men had been working on the construction of the uh, Big Bend Highway, but uh, this was a good opportunity for locals to be able to make a, a few extra dollars. 350 a day was actually quite good pay at the time. They were um, encouraged to, uh, dress, to come dressed in working clothes and with an old fashioned hat if possible. Uh, there were several scenes where they required good big crowds, including the, uh, the, the riot scenes near the end of the, the picture. That's in my slides. Um, the cameraman uh, who's uh, at the, seated there in that photograph on the, this camera rig was uh, Sidney Bonnet. And he was a British cameraman. And uh, in 1933, he'd been with the Houston Mount Everest expedition filming from land and air. And um, his um, uh, son visited Revelstoke several years ago and uh, met him and we were able to show him some of the pictures that we had, particularly in the, the Allwood uh, fam album because the Allwoods had become quite good friends with uh, Sydney and he'd actually sent them pictures of his, his young son, the one that came to visit. Uh, the King Edward Hotel was their base of operations, although several cast and crew members were also billeted. They uh, were uh, building a lot of the sets on Campbell Avenue between Second and Third Streets. And at that time, Campbell Avenue still had a spur track on it. The spur track had been built in the 1890s and um, there were a lot of warehouses and coal sheds along the spur track but uh, that was where they created their, their townscape. Um, the uh, Rat Trap Saloon uh, is actually on the corner, what it's now part of the, um, not sure what he, the name of the Grills Hotel, it used to be the, the um, um, McGregor's. Um, the uh, Rat Trap Saloon was the old CB Hume warehouse, which was right on that corner. They had taken the upper floor off of it and transformed it into the, into the saloon. There was uh, uh, several scenes done inside the saloon as well. And some other photographs showing the, uh, showing the sets. Uh, the newspaper of uh, uh, May 1st, 1936 said, Hollywood is taking shape. Several new false front, uh, fronts erected in the past week and others to be erected soon. And it said that it was all local labor and material other than a professional crew. And uh, George Busby, the producer, was in charge of getting the sets prepared. Uh, there was a banquet held in the uh, King Edward Hotel dining room with over 100 guests uh, hosted by the Board of Trade in honor of the executive and technical staff. President uh, F.H. Allwood pr presided. After the dinner, they had a community sing song and uh, followed by uh, songs and local entertainment by some of the local people who were good singers or performers. Uh, C.A. Cottrell, who was the assistant general manager of the CPR Vancouver, was also present. But they were giving a lot of cooperation to the, the film as well. Um, Cottrell did share a cautionary uh, tale about the mob scenes. He said that there was a filming of a movie called Timber in the Windermere area uh, several years ago and that uh, 17 members of the mob were taken to hospital after they started fighting with each other and settling uh, local scores. Uh, so he told them to be a little bit cautious in who they were involved in the local mob scenes. Uh, they were also welcomed by the mayor of the time who was Anselmo Pratolini. Uh, they started filming in Rogers Pass in um, uh, the early May, 1936. And this was without the actors yet. They were just doing some of the preliminary scenes. They uh, dug up the abandoned uh, Rogers Pass line of the CPR, which was no longer in use uh, because of the, the Connaught Tunnel. But uh, early May, they were still having to deal with quite a bit of snow up there. So they weren't quite able to get um, all of the scenes that they wanted right away. Um, the, uh, on uh, May 20th, 1936, the uh, engine uh, 522 arrived in Revelstoke. It was one of the earliest CPR locomotives to run on the regular service out of Winnipeg. And at the time of the filming, it was uh, 48 years old. It had, uh, and they were storing it in the CPR shops here until they needed it for the actual film shoots. 
Um, it, uh, they also brought in several old box cars, coaches, and flat cars. Um, and they were reconstructing uh, some of the, the pieces that they didn't have available. Uh, the 522 had been built in Pittsburgh in 1884. Uh, the original number was 143. And um, it hadn't been in active service since uh, 1910. Uh, it was hauled uh, deadhead with a freight train to Revelstoke, but was still capable of running on its own. In the middle of June, they uh, erected some sectional houses at Glacier, as well as several log buildings. Uh, they had a, um, uh, built a bridge over the river near Glacier, and most of the new track lane for the picture had been finished by a CPR crews. But as I said, they had a lot of uh, support and help from the CPR. Uh, they were getting more equipment en route from Hollywood. Uh, they were transforming a gravel pit near the city into a muskeg scene where the, the train goes into a, into a muskeg. Uh, they were, um, had sound equipment that was being tested out and they sent test strips of film run uh, sent to Vancouver for development to ensure that the sound equipment was in good shape. Uh, they had uh, construction work uh, work on doing, done on the sets um, near Five Mile Camp on the Big Bend Highway, which is just a little ways uh, north of town, actually just uh, below where the dam is now. Uh, they were also uh, building sets um, on Mount Revelstoke near the lookout station and in town. Uh, but the big excitement happened in uh, the end of June 1936 when the actors arrived. Uh, they had, most of them had a lot of the actors that they were using uh, had been in England. So they uh, uh, came over by Empress of Britain, arrived in Quebec on June 25th, and then traveled by train across Canada. Um, included in the party was uh, Richard Arlen, uh, who's on the right here, uh, on the scene taken on top of Mount Revelstoke. Uh, he was the leading man uh, in the, uh, the film. He was born Cornelius Richard von Matamor, and uh, he served in the Royal Canadian Flying Corps as a pilot, and then went to Los Angeles. He was originally a motorcycle messenger at a film laboratory, uh, but he was spotted, as people often are in Hollywood, and uh, did his first film in 1921, uncredited, and then had a supporting role in the Oscar winner Wings in 1927. After that, he went to have uh, with a lengthy career in uh, film and TV. He appeared in a total of 148 movies and several TV shows before his death in 1976. Uh, one of the things that I do in the evening for fun is watch uh, Perry Mason uh, reruns, you know, the old Perry Mason, and he was in an episode of Perry Mason. So to me, that's sort of the pinnacle of success. Um, he was also an avid golfer. And uh, while he was here, any free time he spent golfing, uh, he beat the course record. Uh, said over the uh, 3,100 yard nine hole layout of the Revelstoke Golf Club, Richard Arlen carded a fine 33-34 for a total of 67 to defeat the longstanding course record of 68 by one stroke. Mr. Arlen's superb exhibition of golf was in keeping with his score and remarkable owing to his not having played since leaving England about three weeks ago. He also uh, took some time off to go to Vancouver at uh, the end of July to play in the Point uh, Grey uh, Golden Jubilee Golf Tournament. And Bing Crosby was also at that, uh, at that tournament. Uh, so he, he was a big deal in town. People were really enjoying seeing him. Uh, when the, the stars arrived, uh, they had at least 2,000 people uh, swept the police protection aside at the station and uh, swarmed and to, to, to get a glimpse of the film stars and to get, uh, get autographs. Um, some of them were saying that they didn't, most people didn't make that big of a fuss of them other places. So they were kind of enjoying, enjoying it. Um, A picture, another picture showing uh, some of the, uh, the crew and actors. Uh, the woman in the long dress was uh, Lily Palmer, and uh, she was quite a well-known actress in uh, her time. Uh, she uh, was originally uh, uh, born in Germany, uh, 
born 1914 and lived till 1986. Um, she was at one time she was married to Rex Harrison, well-known actor, uh, but uh, a well-known actor in, in her own right. Um, well, was also going to mention that uh, when Richard Arlen, you know, he, because he was so interested in golf, he actually donated a golf uh, trophy for the local golf club. And he also did donated a swimming and diving trophy for the uh, for Williamson's Lake, which is where they were doing the swimming and diving competitions at the time. And uh, we still have that trophy in our, he, that trophy was eventually donated to the museum and we have it here in our collection. Um, uh, this fellow here, I'm not sure what his name was, uh, but they, with the uh, the mustache there, but he uh, f features in quite a few of the the riot scenes. Um, he was uh, actually in inciting the riot. Uh, there's uh, some of the the actors at rest: Richard Arlen and Antoinette Sellier, who was a British actress who uh, played the uh, the romantic lead. Um, she played uh, Mary Moody, and uh, who was the the daughter of um, um, Moody, who was the, the, in charge of the construction of the railway. Um, next uh, to her is Jay Farrell McDonald, who played uh, Major Rogers, and then Barry McKay, who is um, he has a very uh, posh British accent in the film. Um, he was uh, he played a friend of uh, Richard Arlen's character Hickey. Uh, Barry McKay's character was named Steve, who was kind of a remittance man, um, who was kind of a, you know, ne'er do well, but ends up uh, being redeeming himself. And Richard Arland, in his character uh, Hickey, uh, actually comes into the play as a, as a gambler, and ends up being kind of the second in charge of railway construction. <laughs> so um, a lot of uh, very improbable things going on in the film, but that's kind of what makes it fun. Uh, there's a picture of Antoinette Sellier. Um, she was a fairly well-known uh, British actress and her father was also a, a British actor. Uh, the uh, man in the fur hat again is uh, Jay Farrell MacDonald in his uh, gear as uh, Major Rogers. And next to him is Roy Emerton as Moody. And Roy Emerton was also a well-known British actor. Um, and Roy Emerton had actually been out in this area previously. He had um, been in the area in 1912. He was uh, kind of doing a little bit of mining in the area, uh, in the Illisilouid area, and um, was um, also wor worked briefly as a railway fireman on the big hill out of field. So he was actually familiar with uh, the area before he came out here for the filming. Um, he played Moody, who was the man in charge of the railway construction and has a town named after Moodyville. Mm -hmm. So they might have taken that like from Port Moody. But um, yeah, there was uh, people from the Stony Nakoda nation in, in Alberta were used as extras in some of the, the scenes where they were, where Major Rogers was supposedly, you know, discovering the path and uh, they, the uh, indigenous people were used as guides in that. Uh, once the, uh, the actors got in town and they started uh, doing uh, the filming, um, they were started with uh, some film work on the, the Big Bend Highway. Uh, they, at the, so near the site of a, a railway or a, a highway construction camp. They started there on uh, Monday, July 6th. So they were on the brink of the Columbia River Canyon, five miles from the city. And Barry McKay as Steve, the, the kind of remittance man character uh, featured in several shots in that uh, first day of filming. So they managed to get 16 shots in that first day. Uh, but uh, while they were doing some of the filming up there, there was uh, an accident. They had an old um, uh, steam uh, scoop. I believe that, that it, that's it uh, on the side there. It uh, collapsed after a pulley broke. The uh, cameraman, James Swarbrick, was riding the boom of the crane in order to get some uh, unusual angles and the machine gave way. Uh, luckily he was uninjured and the film laborers uh, escaped injury by leaping out of the path of the boom. Uh, as part of the filming on the Big Bend, they also did a, uh, 
spectacular dynamite blast uh, on the, the canyon uh, just north of town said that it was delayed more than once due to poor weather. Uh, the newspaper said the drilling of the 30 foot precipice and the loading of three boxes of dynamite and power was supervised by D. Lowe, formerly in charge of road construction in the area. The producers had its whole battery of four movie and two still cameras lined up for the shot in a bomb proof log hut perched on the lower edge of the highway. And that's this little, sorry, uh, that's this. That's their little uh, bomb proof hut that they had uh, set up. Um, it uh, said this hut seemed to be almost suspended in the air above the canyon and looked none too safe to most people. I think we can agree on that. The explosion dislodged about 200 tons of rock, which was shot out across and up on the highway. This mass of rock was soon moved over the high river bank by the crew of extras employed by the moving picture people. So the extras were actually having to do some pretty hard work as well as just being showing extras in the, the scene. Uh, the, uh, during the, uh, the filming, they used to have uh, little columns in the newspapers called doings on the movie lots. And they would report on some of the things that, you know, sort of cute little things that the actors said and did and how local people were involved. Um, they mentioned in one that, uh, Two local women, Kay Harwood and Dorothy Lundell, were stenographers on the script work. So uh, some of the, the women got some decent jobs out of it as, as well. Um, sorry. Not sure if these were uh, local people or if they had been brought in uh, to be involved in, on the film. Uh, there was a mention that, uh, well, the Calgary Stampede was on the associate producer, Mr. Stapenhorst, uh, went there to uh, looking for potential cowboys for some of the, 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 the some of the shots, and they actually did bring in some cowboys and horses for some of the filming. Um, it also said uh, many happy members of cast and crew were uh, on the arrival of the first mail from the old country since they arrived in Revelstoke. So remember, it took things had to travel by uh, by ship at that time, so they were happy to get letters from home. Uh, they also had um, a cricket team of the, the film crew, the Gulmont British cricket team, and they were playing matches against the local cricket team. Um, they hired a school bus from the Okanagan Valley and also hired local trucks to transport technicians and crews uh, from the location to and from the location in the canyon. Um, but it said the artists and other principals were uh, traveling by taxi. They didn't put them on the buses. Um, it was another note um, that overheard on the movie location. Uh, one of the actors was uh, Slim Whitaker, who um, I think some of you may have heard of his name. He, um, over the course of his career, he appeared in more than 300 films, mostly Westerns. He had originally started his career as a, uh, a writing extra and a stuntman. Uh, so he, he liked, the, he was a horseman. Um, apparently he uh, called one of the extras, hey, horse collar. And the guy looked at him and said, what? And uh, Slim Whitaker explained, that's what we call everybody down in California when we don't know their names. Um, they also had uh, the uh, local uh, uh, Chinese res residents who were also working as extras for some of the scenes too. They brought a, another uh, engine up from Vancouver uh, brought out to Moodyville, which is out at Three Valley. And we'll look at that in just a bit. Um, the, uh, the, they had a, a large number of extras at Three Valley as well, both men and women. They were moving the props out there along with uh, sound and lighting equipment. This is some of the, uh, the film work for the, um, in the mountains. And I'm not sure if they were done in the soccer. So they might have, the filming might actually been done in the Rockies, even though it was portraying the, the Selkirks, because they also did quite a bit of film work in um, Lake Louise and, uh, and Yoho and Field and, and Golden. Uh, so I'm not sure the exact location where they did the mountain work, but um, it, when you, if you get a chance to see the film, you can see there's some, you know, there's some pretty tricky uh, shots there. So uh, it would have been you know, quite something for the filmmakers to be up in the mountains doing some of the shots. 
uh, there's back uh, showing the Rat Trap Saloon back on um, on Campbell Avenue or um, Campbell Avenue at uh, at Second Street. And again, some of the uh, the shots. It they they definitely first uh, definitely uh, transformed it into a you know railway construction zone, and the photographs were actually. Um, quite similar to some of the photographs we have of the, the construction areas, um, the construction communities in Rogers Pass and, and Illisillowet. There's one there that actually says Illisillowet uh, on the front of it. Uh, these are some of the extras at the station. And uh, so this is when they uh, went, made it out to, uh, to Moodyville at, uh, at Three Valley. Um, you can see it's quite a set there. Uh, they've got the, the old engine 522. Uh, see the several horses there. Um, and some of the other work that was done in, in setting up the, the Moodyville station. This was a snapshot that was uh, from a, a collection that was donated several years ago by uh, Victor Threatful. And it was actually taken by uh, not sure if it, he was the extra or if uh, somebody else had taken it. But uh, of course, um, the extras were taking pictures whenever they could as well and getting autographs whenever they could. And this one is actually showing Barry McKay as, a ste as Steve in the bowler hat and uh, Richard Arlen as Hickey uh, stepping down from the train. And uh, this was when he started out the film, he was, you know, dressed a little bit more fancy at the time because he was a gambler. Um, and later on, he appears in work clothes when he ends up uh, being one of the main people involved in the construction. Um, I'm not sure who this was, whether it was a local person or one of the, the film crew or not, uh, but there's uh, the person that's supposedly uh, running the engine 522. It's so another photograph of the, the crew at, um, on Mount Revelstoke and some of the actors, there's um, uh, Richard Arlen is uh, right there. It's hard to pick out some of the others, but um, the uh, the locals did a lot of entertainment um, as of the of the the actors and cast. Um, so I said most of the actors were staying at the King Edward Hotel, but uh, there were local people who were billeting some of the other uh, crew members as well. So the community got very, very involved in it. Uh, the, there was one day when um, Slim Whitaker and three other of the, the horsemen on the set uh, did this little kind of skit right on, uh, on the second street outside the King Edward Hotel. They were doing kind of this, they were, one of them was dressed as a sheriff and he was arresting people who were going by and uh, they um, arrested the, the police officer who, who drove by and uh, started to take his vehicle apart. So they were you know, doing a little bit of some hijinks there. And then they um, got all the kids to, who were there to um, do uh, bicycle races and um, foot races. So it provided a lot of entertainment for the locals as well. Um, on, um, there was a big... Um, picnic uh, sponsored by the uh, community on July 26th. I think it was the Board of Trade that actually uh, sponsored it. And uh, they held it at the summit of, of Mount Revelstoke. They'd had to delay it for quite a while. They wanted to do it earlier on in the filming, but um, they didn't, the, the film crew needed to be able to, to focus on the actual film right away. So they asked the locals to put off the, uh, the, the, the picnic. But you can see they hauled tables to the top of the mountain and hauled all the food up there. Uh, there were several of the local women who were involved in, in setting this all up. It was uh, Mrs. Kolofsky, who was very involved in the community for a long time. She was really involved in things like the, um, the May Day uh, celebrations and other events like that. Uh, there was Mrs. Hume, Mrs. C.B. Hume, uh, Mrs. Holton, and, uh, and quite a few others. So you know, there was a lot, a lot going on there. Um, so it became uh, quite exciting for the, for the locals to be able to, to uh, entertain the, the crew. 
Um, they uh, also did some filming, actually that's kind of out of place there. Uh, they also did some filming um, south of town at uh, Greenslide and uh, close to Arrowhead as well. Uh, there was um, in uh, the end of July, 1936, there were several accidents that happened at Greenslide during the shooting. There was a, a local school teacher named Edith McCoy who uh, was employed um, as an extra and she was injured when her horse ran away. Uh, she had uh, the uh, horse kind of charged against a tree trunk and sort of bashed her right leg up against the tree, but uh, she wasn't terribly injured. The, the horse was caught by one of the cowboys from Calgary and Slim Whitaker had his leg broken as a result of a tumble from a horse when they were sliding down a steep sand embankment. He was uh, confined to his room um, with the uh, Mr. and Mrs. J.Q. McKinnon. Uh, Jack London, who was also a horseman and actor, was involved in two accidents. In one, he was trampled by a horse with injuries to his groin. And then he later found himself under a pileup of four horses. Um, he had uh, some minor injuries to his hand, neck and head, but they went, they went right back at it. Uh, they did uh, film several scenes at uh, South at Montana Slough and Greenslide and Arrowhead. And uh, for some of those they brought in, that's where they brought in some of the cowboys and horses. Um, in uh, August, they moved to uh, Golden and Lake Louise for filming. And uh, they were involving uh, some of the indigenous people from the Stony and Nakoda Reserve in Alberta uh, to, uh, in some of the exploration and, uh, and river scenes. The uh, movie unit, uh, um, oh, and, uh, during part of the, the filming in uh, the mountains said they spent one whole day to secure a shot of an eagle in flight. Uh, they were kind of using the story that there was kind of this story that Walter Moberly had discovered Rogers or Eagle Pass by seeing an eagle fly through. And they could have used that story to sh as the eagle showing Major Rogers the way through Rogers Pass. And uh, they had a man named Sepp Algier, who was an international, internationally known photographer. And Rudolf Amer, a, uh, a guide and mountain climber, were uh, involved in trying to capture those scenes. Uh, they managed to catch uh, two flying eagles in one take, as well as one bird in another, uh, another take. Uh, got those uh, shots south of Golden. Um, they were quite happy about that because it said in the newspaper that, you know, Gaumont uh, British liked to be realistic in its filming. And so they wanted to make sure that they had real eagle. But uh, the realism in the filming didn't really carry through because there's one scene where they're uh, trying to race to rescue this train from going into the muskeg. And during the course of the, if you look carefully in the shots, some of them, they're, they're uh, riding their horses through on the summit of Mount Revelstoke. And some of them, it looks like they're riding them like uh, south of town and north of town, maybe even around, around Golden. So that's all in one horse, horse scene there. Uh, they're probably in quite a few different landscapes there. So the realism didn't really extend all the way through the, the production. Um, they moved back to uh, Revel, filming in Revelstoke in early September, and the paper was quite happy. It says, the family has been reunited. The members of the Great Barrier Unit returned to Revelstoke, their faces wreathed in smiles. The residents of the city were all smiles too because of the return of the film folks. And they were uh, getting, signing up uh, more extras at that time for the film scenes which were coming up, or the, the riot scenes. They also did uh, several scenes in the skating rink, which they transformed into the, into the CPR boardroom. And um, they, they did, looks pretty good because it doesn't, this doesn't look like the dingy skating rink. It uh, looks like a boardroom. Um, can't remember the name of the actor in the middle, but that's uh, representing uh, Sir John A. MacDonald. And then I think the fellow with the darker beard was representing uh, uh, Van Horn, William Cornelius Van Horn. Uh, there were a few local people who were involved in those scenes as well, just kind of the, the background actors. There was E.A. Boyle, who was a local lawyer. 
and Dr. A.L. Jones and H.J. McSorley, who was the owner of the King Edward Hotel and Jay Donaldson, who was a local druggist, were all in the, the boardroom scenes, but uh, I haven't been able to, I'm not sure, um, I haven't been able to pick those out specifically. And some of these uh, scenes were the, by the professional photographers of the, the, the film crew. That's why some of them are really, you can tell they're really good, high quality photographs. Um, Antoinette Sellier and Lily Palmer left for England on September 9th. That they'd made many friends both on and off the movie set and said the arms of the two stars were heaped with beautiful bouquets at the deco. Last minute snapshots were taken of the young ladies. They expressed their delight at having spent a summer of unexcelled joy in such a beautiful scenic spot as Revelstoke. They held a, a farewell party on September 18th uh, at the Masonic Hall, hosted by the film company. Well, before I get to that, I'll uh, show you some of the um, the riot scenes. They actually set fire to the uh, to one of the buildings and. Uh, there was actually a, a near miss. A couple of the, the stars came close to being actually in danger in some of these fire scenes. Uh, they had the had straw and were setting fire to, this was the cabin of, of Moody. And they were, the, 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 the plot line is that the workers were mad because they hadn't been paid. So they were rioting uh, about that and uh, they, they were being told that they would be paid as soon as the pass was found, uh, which is obviously not the way it worked, but that's, that was kind of the plot line. And so they were desperately waiting for Rogers to, to give a signal that he'd found the pass, uh, but they're setting up for the, the riot scenes. Um, it's possible that Ken's dad was in, is in this photograph because he was one of the extras. A lot of local young men got jobs there. Uh, and that's another part of the, the riot where they set fire to a, to a train. Um, another great photo. And uh, some more filming at the, the station. And uh, just a few, a few more photographs there showing the filming this on back on Campbell Avenue. Uh, that's up in the, the mountains. And uh, another shot that's uh, Sydney in the middle is Sydney Bonnet, the uh, cameraman, with uh, some of the canoes doing some of the shots in the, the river. And uh, I'm not sure exactly where this was taken, but uh, I think this might have been part of the, the Muskeg uh, setting where they, the train had actually gone off the tracks. But I haven't, I'm not, I haven't been able to figure out exactly where that one was taken. And uh, another shot of one of the, the buildings. And there's uh, 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 Roy Emerton as Moody and Antoinette Sellier as his daughter, Mary Moody, who was the love interest of the, uh, the Richard Arlen character, trying to protect themselves against the rioting mob. Um, so uh, they had a farewell party um, had they had a, a dinner um, at the um, uh, King Edward Hotel uh, banquet, and then they had a party in the Masonic Hall, which was across the street where the tire uh, shop is now on uh, September 18th. And um, the newspaper said, all good things must come to an end. This is the general feeling of everyone in Revelstoke with respect to the completion of the Great Barrier. And the last of the English actors had left and they were uh, soon followed by the Hollywood actors. Said the presence of this, the unit in Revelstoke this summer has been the greatest pleasure ever afforded the community, which has been in some small measure host to such a splendid aggregation of artists and staff. And it would, would be the supreme satisfaction of all of us to know that the stay of our distinguished visitors had been equally pleasurable to them. From the financial aspect of the stay of the picture people here, it can be said that it has been of untold value uh, to scores of local men and women, many of whom earned good wages while engaged by the picture company. The business people of the town also came in for good trade as a result of the stay here of the picture people. 
Tourists flock to town in more than usual numbers as well to have a peep of movies in the making. And these also left a few dollars in town. Uh, so it, uh, the film premiered in, uh, in April of uh, 1937 across Canada and opened in Calgary on April 2nd with, uh, to good reviews. And then it premiered in Revelstoke at the Province Theatre on April 25th. Uh, the actors were, uh, some of the actors sent uh, messages which were read from the theatre stage by uh, F. Uh, Farrell uh, MacDonald or by F. H. Allwood. Uh, there was one from Richard Arlen said, to all my friends in Revelstoke, my sincere greetings. I am more than sorry I cannot be with you for the opening of Silent Barriers. Again, thanks for your part in, make, in the making of this picture and for making our stay so pleasant. Sincerely, your friend, Richard Arland, Los Angeles, California. They also got one from uh, Jay Farrell MacDonald and some of the other uh, uh, people involved in the film. This was um, in the uh, album uh, scrapbook from the Allwood family. And it was actually an ad for Cadbury's milk chocolate. So it's going on about the film. And then it's, it says, we wrecked trains and dynamited whole hillsides to make the Great Barrier. The CPR cooperated with us wholeheartedly. In all, we spent 15 weeks in the Rockies, mainly around Lake Louise. But often we were filming several hours travel away from the nearest possible base. We often started out at four or five in the morning, trekking through forests and up mountains for hours. And that before we even started work. It was pretty hard going and the food problem was often worrying. So I never set out without some Cadbury's milk chocolate in my pocket. It was easy to carry, pleasant to eat, and satisfy the worst hunger. And uh, this was the um, uh, invitation to uh, Mr. Allwood for the farewell dinner in uh, September before the crew had left. Uh, so it was um, premiered at the uh, um, uh, at the Province Theatre uh, on April 25th. And the Province Theatre is uh, where the TELUS building is now, right across from the, the Regent. That was uh, where the, the Palace Theatre was located. Um, it, uh, the, it was, uh, the, it was the, the speech by Mayor Hardman and um, mention of some of the local bit players uh, as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Dr. Jones and uh, some of the others. Um, the interesting thing about like a lot of the movie ads, it would give you kind of the plot lines. So here it says, see a whole train engulfed in a muskeg, men caught in a real, in real forest fire, drowning in treacherous rapids, caught in a tremendous slow snow slide, dying in a swamp, the rioting mobs and burning of houses and railway cars, the fall from a precipice, the race to save a doomed train, the blasting of a huge mountainside, the majestic grandeur of the Canadian Rockies, I didn't mention the Selkirks, no. the historic meeting of the railway financiers with Sir John A. Macdonald, courage of the women, fortitude of men in the face of danger and starvation, the tender romance, Canada's magnificent epic. <laughs> oh. And it, 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 it's, a, it's a cute film. It's, it's rather cheesy and this is that it's highly inaccurate but it's really fun to watch. Um, I am going to show it on uh, this, uh, this Friday at three o'clock at the museum. So if anybody wants to, to come and watch it, we'll, uh, we'll show it then. Um, uh, there's the, uh, the film poster for the, the film Silent Barriers. So thank you for coming. Um,